So that, yeah, Columbia, as well as most of our academia's ties to the military industrial complex, you know, our friend, uh, my friend, uh, Ray McGovern, he doesn't say military industrial complex, complex anymore, MIC. He says Mickey Matt, which is M-I-C-I-M-A-T-T. -T. Let me see if I can get it right. Military industrial congressional intelligence media academic think tank conference co co complex wow. excuse me right and i would add in the banks as well and the fossil fuel corporations and, and all those but you see that type of of the the hundreds of millions of dollars the billions of dollars uh, that go into our university system both from our government whether it's from the pentagon whether it's from the intelligence community whether it's from the state department or from the weapons companies themselves you know, these, these, these universities are receiving millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars from the military industrial complex, as well as then from big conservative right wing donors, as well as from big liberal uh, donors as well, who are threatening yep. to pull their money back. And what we see happen this week in Congress, you saw a, um, uh, an effort, uh, it, well, it passed. Uh, and so the House is going to have six different committees. I think I got that number right. Six different committees begin to investigate universities on charges of anti-Semitism. And of course, what they want to do is they want to appoint special monitors for these universities and colleges to ensure that if colleges and universities are not adhering to our Congress's standard on speech, then no federal no then no federal money will be going to those universities and colleges right i mean so what yeah. we're seeing here is 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 just just not just on this issue on the on a holistic level this is incredibly dangerous and there's no no surprise that what you had happened in the last week or so in terms of assaulting our first amendment including uh the ban on tiktok uh, you've also yes. seen assaults on the Fourth Amendment because you assault the First Amendment, you are naturally going to do that in the Fourth as well. It's going on with the, the genocide that's currently going on in Gaza. And now we've seen a uh, a really a huge a plethora of different groups, of student groups that have taken over college campuses all over the country in their response to the genocide that's going on in Gaza pushing their schools to divest from Israel. Uh, it started off with Columbia, now you have USC, Emory University, University of Florida is now getting into it. University of South Florida is now getting into mm -hmm. it now. Um, I'm hearing underpinnings that here in Florida, as well as many others. And so I just wanted to, for the audience to see uh, some of what has happened at Columbia over the last, uh, you know, 24 hours or so. Uh, this is actually out of Middle East Eye. So hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, it's a little bit small, but let's get into this. This is really short. I've, I've covered lots of, of, of this sort of stuff around the world, and I've never seen this many police moving into one area. Okay, let's talk it about this shot. Clear. We're now. Hey, Miguel, How many? this shot we're seeing now, uh, uh, where's, yeah. where's this? Uh, Control room, where's this those? is 100, 114th Street, east of Broadway. So they are as close to campus as you can get, and police clearly getting ready to go in. I. So, as we can see, as of right now, there's a ton of police that have went in uh, as of the last 24 hours to clear out the students who are protesting, um, and they are occupying the courtyard they also took um over and occupied a building i think it's called the hamilton hall um there's also actually body cam footage that recently just came out uh within the last 24 hours about uh the police coming in and uh also going through hamilton hall i'm not going to show too much of it but uh the the most um really that has happened was uh around let's go right here so they actually broke the police actually broke broke the barricades and made their way in to uh confront the students <laughs> So 
So I'm not going to show the entire thing because of YouTube guidelines. But one of the thing, reasons why I wanted to share that was because um, there was some recent um, there was some recent remarks by President Joe Biden. And before I get into that, just wanted to get your opinion about the protests that are going on around the country by students within these colleges in regards to their protest against the genocide in Gaza. Right. I think there's there's more than 100 nationwide and there's dozens that have popped up overseas as well. Um, and, and, you know, you, you scratch your head at this and you say, you know what, if they had just left these kids alone, if they had paid them no attention, you know, you and I wouldn't be talking about this like this. The whole world wouldn't be talking about this, that the American empire wouldn't be exposed for the um, fragile, uh, uh, the fragile uh, uh, creature that it actually is because that's the, that's the, the the nature behind all of this yeah the the the, 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 the elites uh, the system it's really upset that people are offending their entitlement right they're really upset uh, at the nature of their lies being called out so brazenly and so and so clearly but however the re, the strongest thing i think that motivates uh, this this these brutal police state crackdowns, essentially. And we just saw it happen in uh, UCLA last night, more than a hundred students arrested, uh, you know, getting shot with rubber bullets and, uh, you know, um, is the fear, right? And so when, you know, all you have are lies, when everything you are doing, your policies, when your actions, when, when everything about who you are as a leader, as the ruling elite, as the system is based upon lies, when that's what the foundation is, you can only reply with violence. And so they're scared to death that these protests were going to spread. They're scared to death that these protests are going to communicate, they're going to inform, they're going to provide uh, opportunities for other people to mobilize and organize, and they know that's dangerous to them. So I think that's why you have seen such a rush to crack down is the fear, right? There's also, too, the way the whole thing has been structured now. You see these university administrators scared to death that the big money donors are going to pull their money. And so, yeah. right, and then the politicians, of course, you see uh, if Benjamin Netanyahu makes a statement, immediately you have, uh, you know, not just second and third tier members of Congress parroting what Benjamin Netanyahu is saying, but you have uh, the senior members of our government, Joe Biden, Tony Blinken, Speaker Johnson, Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, whoever, saluting and following what Netanyahu is saying. I mean, so you see on so many levels how corrupt uh, our, our, our empire is, but also, too, you see in that as well, the very fragile nature, how it is built upon a foundation of lies and that it has yeah. to then react violently like it's been doing because it can't it can't argue otherwise. It can't it can't discuss. It can't debate. It can't confront. All it can do is react violently. Yeah, of course. I want to get your thoughts on what uh, President Biden actually just said recently uh just a shout out to let this radicalize you on twitter and joe biden's actually given his remarks regarding uh the student protesters all over the country let's just take a look so let me be clear peaceful protest in america violent protest is not protected peaceful protest is it's against the law when violence occurs destroying property is not a peaceful protest it's against the law Vandalism, trespassing, breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations. None of this is a peaceful protest. Threatening people, intimidating people, instilling fear in people is not peaceful protest. It's against the law. Dissent is essential to democracy, but dissent must never lead to disorder or to denying the rights of others so students can finish the semester and their college education. Look. It's basically a matter of fairness. It's a matter of what's right. There's the right to protest, but not the right to cause chaos. So let me be. Your thoughts on uh, what Joe Biden said. Well, I want to amend what I said about how you can only react with violence because they'll also react with lies. They'll just stack more lies on top of their lies. So this idea that somehow uh, these are violent protests. I mean, there's no there's no violence occurring. Violence is coming from the police forces. That's it. And the counter protesters. 
That's it. There's no violence coming out of these these, these encampments. Uh, these are these are, are college students and their faculty, along with supporters, uh, peacefully protesting. I mean, the, the, the idea that somehow this crackdown was needed to restore order is just another lie on top of all the other lies. But what do we expect? These are the same people. Joe Biden's the same people who who you know uh, claims it's not genocide but self-defense what Israel's doing to the Palestinian people. Um, and then I heard this morning, remind this morning. Um, one commentator on Al Jazeera, uh, he cited uh, uh, Martin Luther King in his 1963 letter from a Birmingham jail. And uh, mm -hmm. as King said, the greatest obstacle is the white moderate who values order over justice. And that's essentially yeah. what we see with Joe Biden right there, you know, as well as I think most uh, white moderates, so the, most of the Democratic Party, uh, or not most, but a good portion of that Democratic Party that agrees that order is more important than justice. Yeah, um, and that was something that we were constantly, uh, we were constantly warned against. In fact, um, one of the things that was talked about, uh, I, I showed this video a few weeks ago, was that, uh, you know, civil rights activist uh, James Farmer said that we, you know, when it comes to, you know, Black liberation is talked about. We want white people who are willing to go all the way with us. And the thing is, it's like, are we willing to go all the way with the people who are marginalized, with the people who mm -hmm. are uh, are the most disenfranchised? Right now, it's people in places like you know Gaza and really just the entire whole of Palestine, Gaza, West Bank, Rafa. Uh, they are some of the most disenfranchised. The people in Haiti are some of the most disenfranchised. The people in Congo. So are we really able to go all the way with them, you know, and have that solidarity? I, 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 Nick, my comment from RBN says, you know, he said, keep your unity. I want solidarity. Mm -hmm. And so are we willing to go all the way? And from what it looks like, you will have people like Joe Biden, uh, the, the progressive caucus, uh, you know, they will say how they want to you know, a ceasefire, but then they will endorse people like President Joe Biden. I honestly think that it was a a huge misstep. And I, I, I'm probably, you know, understating, but it's a huge misstep to allow Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, to come to your events while you're occupying, you know, Columbia, university and then you know start taking photos with her and being friendly with her in fact she should have not been allowed near that camp uh because honestly like once you have people like her that come in it's the end you know it's it's over and then there was a a i, I would say preemptive victory dance by brown university students who basically, you know, celebrated because then they said, oh, we're going to have a vote, you know, in October right. over our divestment of Israel. A vote? No, it's like, no. Why, why do we have to vote on this? You know? It is. I mean, you, you run into that wall. And, um, you know, with AOC, you make a very good point. Uh, what has she done besides the photo ops? Uh, she had to be hounded founded into saying the words genocide. I mean, and thankfully those activists forced her to do so. You know, that went viral, those activists outside of the movie theater chasing her down the street. And then about five days or a week later, she finally said the words genocide, even as she protested that she'd been saying them all along, which she hadn't been. You know, so that's what you have there. You have someone who she is more concerned with her own political future than actually uh, fulfilling the principles and values to which she supposedly uh, believes and which she attests to. Uh, and so when she shows up at Columbia, like you said, or, 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 or City University, uh, you know, City University of New York, um, you have to be very suspect of what is she actually going to do? I had this conversation last night with a, a guy who's a libertarian. And, you know, we were both saying, while we don't like Tommy Tuberville, the senator from Alabama, the fact that he was willing to hold up all those uh, all those uh, uh, promotions for all those generals and admirals last year and cause like just a complete uh, uh, ruckus, right? Cause all kinds of hysteria and drama over it. 
you know, uh, not for anything that I support him doing it, but I respect that he did it. He was willing to use his office. He was willing to use his power to cause extreme yeah. discomfort for the system to try and get something for his constituency. Now, yeah. AOC doesn't have the power. A house rep doesn't have the power of a senator, of course, but there are certain things they could do. Uh, you know, and yeah. or even just to, you know, if we remember AOC's first day in office when she takes part in that uh, sit in at Nancy Pelosi's office. But by the yeah. end of that, but by the end of that two year cycle, she's calling Nancy Pelosi mama bear. Right. I yeah. mean, and so how do you hold someone like that accountable then? Right. Um, and I think one of the ways is to do it the way you suggested. They should have turned her away. They should have said, you know what, why don't you go get a photo with Mama Bear? Because uh, you've not done what you could do for us. But now here you are in, in this moment. Well, actually, to add to your point, she could have went the, the way of Matt Gates when he and the Freedom Caucus actually withheld their vote for speaker. Right. And then when they actually got a victory over being able to oust Kevin McCarthy, and then put in Mike Johnson. Well, right. Mike Johnson is really just a Kevin McCarthy in, in, in Freedom Caucus face, <laughs> if I can you know, borrow the phrase. But that's basically what he is now. I mean, he's just as much as a Zionist. And so now they're saying they did all that work, and now Mike Johnson is doing basically the same thing. But, you know, it, you can applaud the, 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 the chutzpah of somebody like Kevin McCarthy for actually – making them go 15 rounds and say, no, we're not going to allow you to be speaker unless you concede to these different things. Right. Now, a lot of us, we were talking about forced to vote when it comes to yep. Medicare for all, $15 minimum wage and what have you. But you also could have did it for a ceasefire, right? You could have right. did something like that, you know, and, and it's just... You know, and that's, you know, that's the importance of, of independent and third-party politics right now yes. i mean the idea of course is that we're going to build a multi-party democracy right we're going to have a, a more proportional system uh we'll, we'll have a, a, a an electoral system that's not this uh absurd uh two-party thing we have but you know in the meantime what we have though when we run third party and independent candidates is we have that ability to take power away from other people to be spoilers if you will, I don't like the word spoiler, choose the word disruptor, disrupt the system, disrupt their, their nice setup that they had. They've got a good racket going on, right? And if you can disrupt that, that's going to cause problems. And that's when you can start to extract concessions. And the whole, I mean, if I remember correctly, the, the main concession in 2020 that forced the vote was trying to get in exchange for, for Pelosi's speakership was a vote on Medicare for all. Something that the squad, that these progressive, that these so-called socialists were campaigning upon and were promoting at that point as their major platform policy, right? Yeah. And since then, that platform policy has basically dropped off. You don't hear them speak about Medicare for all at all, uh, right? I mean, so you've actually seen the reverse happen where rather than using what power they could have, they've had their power taken away from them. They've been pummeled and they've been uh, uh, beaten down to the point where these people won't even say the words Medicare for all. They won't say the words living wage. Right. I mean, so um, when was the last time you heard any of them say those things? Uh, so we've yeah. seen actually within the Democratic Party the ability to uh, not just allow for more Democratic nature, small d Democratic nature within the party, but a crackdown. Uh, 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 you know, a real, uh, real effective manner of controlling the party uh, that, you know, if you are a student of these things, I guess it's admirable to look at because they've been effective in controlling their own party. But that comes to the great expense of the American people. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I also wanted to share was this particular video as well, because uh, people like Joe Biden, want to say, well, this is violent. Uh, you guys can't be doing this. There's, there's this proper channels you have to go through. I want to share this because I think this is really important. So this is actual video of them taking over Hamilton Hall. Mm -hmm. And they, they renamed it to Hens Hall. Right. And 
let's go into this. <laughs> The students feel like they need to escalate their form of protest right now because what we're seeing on the ground in Gaza um, is the threat of a ground invasion. We have to protest. Um, we have to shut things down because they refuse to listen to us. This is how we make sure that um, the politicians, no matter where they go, um, are going to be faced with the reality of what's happening in Gaza and faced with the political consequences. Free, free Palestine! They are willing to risk arrest in order to stand firmly with the people of Gaza, and that's exactly what we're seeing them do. No amount of repression is going to break the student movement. I think this is important because it says Columbia students have occupied Hamilton Hall many times before, including during 1968 and 1972 protests against the Vietnam War. In 1985, students held the building for three weeks demanding the school divest from apartheid South Africa. It says the school board divested later that year. This is your fight too. It's our tax dollars that are being invested uh, in the arms that are going um, to the state of Israel, in the arms that are murdering innocent Palestinian people right now. These tax dollars are dollars that could be used for uh, public housing, for education, um, for healthcare. And instead, our government is more invested in war than our own people. So, that was basically the video. I mean, really, it was in honor of a six-year-old Palestinian girl that was murdered by the IDF. Right. And it, that, that story of all the, the heartbreaking stories, the har stories of horror we've seen, the thousands upon thousands, you know, every day you, we, we, we see videos uh, that we never want to see, we never wanted to see, and then we see them again the next day, right? This has just been um, a... a, a we, 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 we're witnessing a genocide, you know, on our screens. And his story stood out uh, because they had her on the phone. They had this audio recording of this little girl calling for help as her family lay dead in the car around her. And then, of course, the Israelis say you can send an ambulance in, and the Israelis shot and killed the ambulance drivers, uh, you know, the two paramedics who went to go save the little girl. And then about a week and a half after this all occurs, uh, they find her body. You know, and just one of at least 35,000 such stories. Uh, and it is to the point in that video, to the point that's being made for for seven months now, the points of being made for decades, essentially, this is not possible without the United States support for Israel. Israel could not be conducting this without all the massive, massive amounts of aid and assistance the U.S. provides in all forms, not just military, but in intelligence, in financial assistance. Most people don't know that Israel, uh, the United States, guarantees all loans issued by Israel. So if Israel issues any debt, 
the United States backs that, you know, I mean, so we're co-signing everything Israel does. I mean, and of course, there's all the diplomatic support. And then, of course, the political support. Most recently, the political support being not just this quashing of the First Amendment on our college campuses, you know, this, these attacks on these students and their faculty because they're standing up against genocide, calling out their universities for investing billions upon billions of dollars in the Israeli genocidal machine. But you also have this week as this rumor, as rumors of the International Criminal Court possibly indicting Benjamin Netanyahu and other Israeli leaders, you see the American Congress reacting immediately. So again, as Benjamin Netanyahu speaks out against possibly being indicted by the International Criminal Court, what do you have? You have members of Congress almost immediately start talking about sanctioning the International Criminal Court, right? Start taking action against the ICC to prevent it. I mean, so that type of political cover and, of course, the diplomatic cover uh, that we've seen by the United States protecting Israel, not just this past year in the UN, but for decades in the United Nations. So, I mean, the, the, the arguments that are being made on these campuses are very well entrenched in the terms of, of what's actually occurring over there, why it's able to occur and why it's being allowed to occur. And, you know, just as that video, uh, James, it says that video uh, alludes to, these students too will be judged correctly and justly by history, just as the civil rights, just as the Vietnam, just as the environmental movement, just as uh, the uh, uh, for South Africa, you know, so forth, the Iraq war, all those things, these students will be judged by history to be correct. Yeah. One of the things, uh, somebody who will not be judged correctly by history is a, uh, a, a, a professor, uh, Rebecca Wiener from Columbia University. This was actually broken. This story broke by the gray zone, uh, Wyatt Reed and, uh, Max Blumenthal that actually broke earlier today. It says Columbia crackdown led by university professor doubling as NYPD spook. So, uh, just to give you guys just a little overview, it says Rebecca Wiener is a Columbia University professor who also serves as intelligence director of the NYPD. Mayor Eric Adams credits her with spying on anti-genocide student protesters and directing the militarized raid that dislodged them from campus. So who was behind that raid was actually a professor. She was behind the raid. Well, let's not forget, too, that Hillary Clinton is a professor at Columbia University, as well as Victoria Newland, uh, mm. recent uh, number two at the State Department, who has been uh, the most fervent uh, in both Republican and Democratic administrations in terms of leading for a new Cold War and essentially a hot war uh, with mm. Russia. Uh, as well as Victoria Newland, of course, was very instrumental in Dick Cheney's office in making sure the Iraq war happened in 02 and 03. So those are two of the more prominent professors who were at Columbia. So that, yeah, Columbia, as well as most of our academia's ties to the military industrial complex, you know, our friend, uh, my friend, uh, Ray McGovern, he doesn't say military industrial complex, complex anymore, MIC. He says Mickey Matt which is M-I-C-I-M-A-T-T. -T. Let me see if I can get it right. Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academic Think Tank Conference. Co co complex, wow. excuse me, right? And I would add in the banks as well and the fossil fuel corporations and, and all those. But you see that type of, of the, the hundreds of millions of dollars, the billions of dollars uh, that go into our university system both from our government, whether it's from the Pentagon, whether it's from the intelligence community, whether it's from the State Department, or from the weapons companies themselves. You know, these, these, these universities are receiving millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars from the military industrial complex, as well as then from big conservative right-wing donors, as well as from big liberal uh, donors as well who are threatening yep. to pull their money back. And what we see happen this week in Congress, you saw a um, uh, an effort, uh, it, well, it passed. Uh, and so the House is gonna have six different committees. I think I got that number right. Six different committees begin to investigate universities on charges of anti-Semitism. And of course, what they wanna do is they wanna appoint special monitors for these universities and colleges to ensure that if colleges and universities are not adhering to our Congress's standard on speech, 
then no federal no then no federal money will be going to those universities and colleges, right? I mean, so what yeah. we're seeing here is 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 just just not just on this issue on the on a holistic level. This is incredibly dangerous, and there's no no surprise that what you had happened in the last week or so in terms of assaulting our First Amendment, including uh, the ban on TikTok. Uh, you've yeah. also seen assaults on the Fourth Amendment because you assault the First Amendment, you are naturally going to do that in the Fourth as well, right? So First yeah. Amendment is public speech. Fourth Amendment is essentially private speech. So what you saw in the last week, just as they're banning TikTok, just as they're 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 assaulting the First Amendment, the Congress is authorizing warrantless spying on the American people through uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, right? I mean, and so expanding it giving the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, local law enforcement, because it's all fused together. And that, I yeah. think that the right there is a great example of that with that professor of that intersection, right? Of, yeah. of, of Mickey Mac, of how you have this intersection of the intelligence community, uh, uh, academia, and then local law enforcement, right? Yeah. And this is what we're up against. Yeah, and one of the reasons, this is her reasoning, right? Because uh she said um let me go here just to make sure one of the things about this lady uh she says um that the problem isn't necessarily uh she said militarized rape was a response to a student rhetoric associated with terrorism right um and she said that, uh, according to Wiener, the police response was not necessitated by any criminal behavior, but by radical language and symbols of the students. So hang on. If she says the police response was not necessitated by any criminal behavior, that means that a crime was not committed. Right. Essentially, right? Essentially, it, it's it's the danger. It's rhetoric. That's what's dangerous. It goes back to why are these crackdowns happening? Again, it's just not the it's not just the fact that their entitlement has been offended, their arrogance, you know, uh, but it is the fear that they have, because this is why speech is the First Amendment. You know, this is why the founding fathers, you know, characterize it as the, the paramount uh, liberty. I mean, and, and speech is important, not just because it allows us to have a free expression of our ideas and our opinions and everything, but because it can inform, because it can mobilize, because it can educate, because it can organize. And that's why they are scared to death of it. And the other aspect, I think, as, as we pull back and we look at this crackdown and how this is, is, this is such a, a great case study for the American empire is look at how our corporate media is rea reacting to this. First of all, media, you've had journalists across the country get beaten up by the police uh, at, at these encampments. You've had a journalist get arrested. You've had journalists get maced and pepper sprayed by the police at these encampments. And what do you see? You see the corporate media not standing up for them. No no surprise. But what do you see? Why, why is the corporate media cheerleading for this police crackdown? Why are they cheerleading for this assault on the First Amendment? Well, some it's because they are part of the power elite. They are part of the elite of the empire. And with that means that they are so threatened by not being able to control the narrative. And that's what yeah. they see this encampment, these encampments as a threat to their ability to control the narrative. This is, this is basically a, a, um, a, a this is a, a, a mass personification of what you are doing, James, right? What other people are doing with this type of technology we have, with the ability to, to inform people, with the ability to educate people, ability to inspire people, right? To organize them. They are scared to death. One, uh, the media is scared to death because it's cutting into their market share, essentially. But also, two, it, it, it's exposing their lies. It's exposing that they are as corrupt and as rotten as the rest of the empire is. Right. And that they're faced with it. So this is how they're reacting. So this is why if you turn on CNN, if you turn on turn on MSNBC, if you turn on Fox, what you hear are just things that are completely untrue, just like Joe Biden's uh, speech that you played a little while ago. 
where he's going on about violence on campus and how people are unsafe and everything else. That's what the major media, the corporate media is saying over and over again. They're hyping this up as something that's not. And it's because one, they want to be good members of the empire. But the other part of it too, is that they see uh, these camps, these students and the personification as the very real threat to the danger, very real danger to them controlling the narrative. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's so much more because I, 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 but due to the sake of time, I wanted to play an excerpt from your speech at the United Nations Security Council. That was a wonderful speech, by the way. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, you know, put Thank that you. there. Uh, you were talking really, uh, essentially, the 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 bulk of the speech was about necessity to leave this notion that we have to continuously keep supporting military operations in Ukraine. But then at towards the end, you actually talked about, uh, you know, the other aspect of what's going on in Gaza and how we really need to also leave that as well, because ultimately it's about not, you know, using our tax dollars and resources to uplift uh, a, a regime like that of a, you know, the Zionist regime over there in, um, in you know, in Israel or occupied Palestine. And so I just want to thank you for that because I think that was absolutely necessary for the world to really hear because a, a lot of times, you know, people, it, you know, I like to tell people who are from the outside of the empire who are looking at us and I go it's like, look, it is not us. We didn't even vote these people in, or <laughs> we did. Okay, we did. As we voted them in, but you know, I mean, really, they're just puppets of the corporations. It's not actually us. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, you know, it kind of feels like that. But that's, I mean, that's get get back to like what you're doing here, right? Uh, and what others others across the internet are doing in terms of this ability to communicate. That allows us for ha have the solidarity around the world. Right. So, you know, having an understanding that that communication, that ability to interact with, I mean, this is something that sure people have always been in solidarity with uh, others. I mean, look, you just talked about the 85 students at Columbia in solidarity with those in South Africa. Right. But it's it's different in the ability for us to have this type of face to face communication. And again, that terrifies them. Because that takes the power away from corporations. They're not just losing control of the narrative. They're losing control of actual interaction. And that's why they're so desperate to do things like ban TikTok, right? I mean, they want everything to go through uh, the American tech giants who are as much of the empire as Raytheon and Lockheed are or Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. right? And uh, State Street Bank are. I mean, so, uh, you know, that is something that we have to keep in mind. This is why people need support the work you're doing, support people like you, you know, because we need to continue to build this because we, even though we have these setbacks, I'm going to say this in spite of the genocide that's occurring because good God, you know, um, but, you know, we are winning and I think it might be small victories, but I do believe we are progressing to a way where we could be said that we are winning. And again, I say that in spite of everything that's happening in Gaza right now, that the genocide of the Palestinian people. But I mean, the point of my speech at the, my, my briefing at the United Nations Security Council was that, was this idea that in Ukraine, we are on a, 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 an escalatory trajectory that is a risk that no one should accept because of where that can lead to in terms of a nuclear war this is something that no one, and this is not hyperbole, this is not exaggeration. This is where, you know, any type of solid objective analysis will lead you to, this is an, uh, we're on this type of escalatory trajectory, and this is a risk we should not be taking. And then of course, speaking about what's happening in Gaza, for the Palestinian sake, of course, to at least say something at that table at the UN Security Council to acknowledge them. It's the least that, you know, anyone could do, but also too, to put that point of like, you don't think we're capable of destroying ourselves. Look what we are doing right now in Gaza. Look at our own inhumanity. Yeah. Look at how through both megalomania and greed, we will go along with the clear destruction of a people playing out on our phones and on our television sets every day. Right. And so that type of, of understanding that what we are up against here, this risk is very real and it is, you know, incumbent to do something about it before it is too late. I mean, the, the phrase that I used, the, the speech 
uh, was basically an, uh, until you know we're you know approaching an, ap- an apocalyptic point of no return. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, and thank you so much for that. Um, I'll probably try to play it clo- at the close, but Matthew Ho, it was so great to have you because it, it, you know uh, you, it's just like. Um, you got a really huge compliment from Scott Ritter about your speech at the UN Security Council. And Scott Ritter's been on it for a while right. now. So, I mean, if you get a compliment from Scott Ritter, you got it, bro. Well, so. yeah, Scott's a, Scott's a friend of mine. And I'm very lucky to have his friendship, but also even more so to learn from him. And yeah, uh, yeah to get a compliment from Scott, that's a pretty big deal for me. But um, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I appreciate you having me back on. Uh, happy to come on whenever. Let's not make it two years again. Uh, but uh, but yeah, thank you for everything you're doing. Yeah, thank you so very much. And where can everybody find you? What you got coming up soon? Oh yeah, so I'm the associate director for the Eisenhower Media Network. Uh, we're a collection of former military and intelligence officials who argue for diplomacy and peace. Uh, you can just Google Eisenhower Media Network. And then I am on Twitter at Matthew P. Ho, P as in Patrick. All right. Thank you so very much. And I'll see you in the next one. Uh, See you. (laughs) Okay, absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.